We have relatively new presidents in France and the United States, mm -hmm. both of whom are really taking, un undertaking fundamental changes in their economies. Give us a sense of the differences and maybe the similarities between President Macron and President Trump. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was in France uh, on Election Day when obviously President Trump was elected. At that time, Emmanuel Macron was running, uh, running on his own party, something called El En Marche. Um, at that point, nobody still thought he was going to mm. win. And actually, uh, the candidate most similar to Trump was Marine Le Pen. Uh, but as we know now from history, Emmanuel Macron won. And not only did he win the presidency, he also, his party also won the parliament. Uh, it was quite an amazing uh, move that a year ago many people thought couldn't happen. But what was very interesting was he wrote, he ran on exactly the opposite platform to Trump's. <laughs> He ran on a pro-trade, and as you know, he made some comments yesterday that saying the EU should react strongly uh, in terms of uh, the current U potential U.S. policy on tariffs. Uh, but he, wrote, he ran on a pro-trade, pro-EU, pro-diversity, uh, and pro-equality, uh, pro really. And also undertaking fundamental reforms of the labor. Well, rules in, in France. I mean, they're also similar in the sense that both of them made a lot of progress in a short time on what they said they wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, the labor reform is a really interesting point because I was in France uh, as the Elan administration tried to get labor reform through. Uh, obviously did not. Uh, and what happened during that time, uh, protests really did shut down the streets of Paris. Mm. Uh, so when President Macron said he was going to do this, I think there was some skepticism. But you know, he did it unbelievably well. I mean, the most important thing, as we said, was he won the assembly and he won the parliament. So his party was in charge. Uh, secondly, he negotiated with the unions. And only one of the large unions strongly opposed uh, opposed the reform. Uh, so it was quite it was quite interesting. The other thing, just back to trade for a second, uh, TTIP was obviously on the agenda mm. when I was in Paris, uh, and we worked quite I worked quite a bit with USTR and the other trade representatives in our government. And it's interesting for me to see what's happening in Asia now, which is as we know TPP and TTIP, neither of them happened. And now we see a group of 11 uh, Asian nations mm. getting together basically to sign pretty much the same thing. Um, and before, it was, it was going to be a counterweight to China. Now, to some extent, it's a counterweight to the U.S. Mm. Having said that, President Trump has been pretty ambivalent, even on the TPP as well. But uh, it, what's interesting is that you mentioned that both leaders run on completely opposite platforms. Mm -hmm. At the same time, mm -hmm. you're seeing this very good personal relationship between them. What, what's happening on that front? Oh, that's an interesting question. Listen, I think, uh, I know when I was in France, um, they were probably, uh, if not our number one, our number two ally, particularly in the fight against uh, terrorism and, and our counter ISIL. Um, the institutions of both countries continue to work together. Our military continues to work together. Our CIA continues to work together. Our law enforcement continues to work together. Um, but on policy, M M President Macron's been been very blunt. I mean, he, he didn't agree at all with what we did in terms of COP21 and climate. He was very he was very strongly for that. And actually, I think he even had a press conference at one point saying, all the scientists and other people that care about climate come to Paris. Our door is open. Mm -hmm. You're telling us about your experiences as the U.S. ambassador to France. Mm -hmm. um, this is, of course, International Women's Day, and we have to talk about the role of women. When you go out there, on the global stage. Mm -hmm. How diverse is the atmosphere among uh, the diplomats? I was telling David earlier that actually in Korea, there are more mm -hmm. female diplomats these days or applicants to be diplomats in Korea than there are in any other jobs. Well, it's interesting. I mean, what I saw in France and my friend, the Irish ambassador, I know was just on your ear because I just saw her in the green room. Um, uh, there were many, many strong female ambassadors when I was ambassador to France. Um, just in my own embassy, many of our top people were women. And actually, if you look at the French government as well, uh, the mayor of Paris is a very strong, uh, formidable woman. Uh, Seglin Royal, who was the environmental minister and who ran for president, uh, in the last administration, the minister of labor was a woman, the minister of education was a woman. What was interesting to me was I saw all of that in sort of the public and in the diplomatic corps. In the, on the private sector side, 
uh, France, I think, is probably even worse uh, than we are. I mean, when I was there, in terms of public company CEOs, no women. Uh, mm -hmm. A few private company had women CEOs. Um, they were starting to make an effort on boards, but, but not much. Uh, but what, one thing that's interesting, I saw from, once again, going back to President Macron, President Macron yesterday said that he was um, going to uh, put together, I, don't, I, I actually don't know if it was a task force, what it was, but um, to make sure there was equal pay for equal work in France. It was a big announcement that came out yesterday of the Elysee Palace. Um, and that's one thing I think really on, frankly, both sides of the Atlantic, we, we need to work on. And we want to come back and talk about that, Shirley, mm -hmm. but, but first, was there ever a moment when you thought maybe they're not treating the same way as they would a male U.S. ambassador to France? You know, it's interesting. I did not, I had, as I said, a fantastic team from the State Department. Um, and, uh, and many of the other di members of the diplomatic corps and the French mm -hmm. government were women. Because of what I went through in Paris, when I was there, we had a series of terrorist mm -hmm. attacks, the three large ones, um, uh, Charlie, Bataclan, mm -hmm. and Nice. Uh, so it meant I was dealing an awful lot with law enforcement and oh. with intelligence. Yeah. Right. So, and in many cases, sometimes yeah. in that case, right. I was the only woman in the room. Earlier, Jane, we were talking about what it was like to be a woman in France at a very senior diplomatic level. Tell us about what it's like to be a senior woman within the U.S. government, within the State Department, and what is the compare and contrast between public and private sector in the United States as opposed to France? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I had, in my previous life, as you said, been in the White House, but um, coming to the State Department, I was in the private sector. Um, I always thought that it was the combination of those skills that really helped me as an ambassador. Hmm. But one of the things that was very important that I saw, because we did go through, as I talked about, we had huge amounts of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was going to France, interestingly, I thought it was going to be about trade, uh, trade finance, mm -hmm. and culture. And it turned out to be counterterrorism and, and military. Uh, but what I came away with was a huge respect for the institutions, for the institution of the State Department, and for the importance of embassies. Uh, and one of the things that does upset me right now is I see some of these amazing career diplomats leaving the State Department. Uh, I also gave a speech at Georgetown Foreign Service a little while ago and they told me young people taking the Foreign Service exam is down about 50 percent. Hmm. We need people like that. We need people like that in our government and we need people like that working for the United States in this world. And give us a sense of the intellectual capital as it were that's being lost because when you have these seasoned diplomats who have been there for their careers and they leave, what replaces it? Well, that's the problem. And my worry is this could be something, uh, a loss for generations, decades and generations, because many of the people that are leaving, as you say, have historical knowledge. They have relationships. Many of these people have, uh, you know, came to the State Department right out of uh, college or graduate school. They've worked there for 25 or 30 years. They've developed uh, relationships and people and huge amounts of respect. Uh, that is going to be terribly hard to rebuild. Talking about talent, how much, uh, how many high qualified, uh, talented people are you seeing among the Democrats now that we're headed to the midterm elections? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I've been focusing particularly um, on some of the House races. And what's interesting to me there is so many talented people, but especially today, so many talented women. Um, I think in so many districts that Democrats have, uh, particularly suburban districts where you're getting independent voters and where women are being energized and women are coming out to vote, women are running as candidates, and women that care about issues, that care about issues like climate, that care about issues like gun control. Um, if you look at the map where I think the swing districts probably will be, my guess is they'll be in the suburbs and they'll be with strong women candidates and many of the women candidates that I know are women candidates that have served in the military um, there's a woman running in the Midwest who did two, two tours in Iraq who I just spoke to last week uh, it's a it's a very very um, impressive group of candidates 
led by women. Through the years, you've been a supporter of Democrats. As you look forward to November right now, mm -hmm. I have to ask you, do you think the House will switch? But maybe as important as that, Jane, is can we get away from the hyperpartisanship? Is there any chance of us moving back to the center, whether it's slightly right of center or slightly left of center? I hope so. I, um, I hope so to both your questions. I, <laughs> I, I hope the, <laughs> the Democrats do win the House. Uh, but I agree with you on the center. I mean, I worked in Washington before the ambassadorship long ago. And when I worked in Washington, it was a place uh, where Republicans and Democrats really did work together. Um, the whole, if you were up on Capitol Hill, as I was often, uh, it was a place where people tried to have consensus, where the head of the Republican Appropriations Committee would sit down with the minority, with the time might have been, probably would be a Democrat, where Tip O'Neill, who was the speaker, his closest friend, uh, was a Republican, head of the Ways and Means Committee. Hmm. It, it was about our country. It was about getting things done, and it was about doing the right thing for our country. So I do. I agree with you both on the Democrats <laughs> winning and on moving back so we can talk to each other.